Hi everybody, thank you for joining SimScale's latest webinar. Today we're joined um, by Jonathan Hunterhill from SAV Systems and the three of us, along with Jesus and myself, will be talking about classroom ventilation optimization. My name is John Wild. I'm VP of Customer Success here at SimScale. I've been running CFD in lots of different companies and guises for 15 or so years at least now. I initially was working as an application engineer, now I'm running the pre-sales, post-sales and product teams here. Hi, my name is Jesus and I'm part of the application engineering team here in SimScale. I have yeah, an aerospace and CFD background and I'm having here my first uh, professional experience in SimScale. And I have more like a role of post sales, like onboarding every new customer and supporting them in all their projects. Um, yeah, so I'm Jonathan Hunter Hill. I'm the sector manager for education at SAV Systems. Um, I've been with SAV some time and primarily focus now on smart ventilation units, um, which are Airmaster. Thank you very much, Jonathan. I'm glad you're here to join us today. Um, we're going to split the webinar into a few sections. So I'm going to speak a little bit about CFD generally and then about SimScale a bit more specifically. And then Jonathan will speak for a little bit also. And then um, Jesus will take over to talk really about this specific um, analysis where we were looking at um, a classroom along with SAV. Okay, so just to talk a little bit about the benefits of simulation a little bit broadly. Um, so really it's often used um, to hopefully reduce costs, um, increase efficiency, reduce the time that it takes to get from the beginning of a design all the way down towards the end, um, hopefully cutting out any of the expensive prototypes that we might want to make or might have needed to make before using simulation before. Um, especially when we're talking about, I would think, SAV and anything on this kind of scale, it's not so easy to prototype a classroom. You really need to get the design and the cooling system right the first time. So that is why simulation um, really is um, super beneficial in these kind of situations. Talking a little bit more just about AEC. So we could look at really kind of large scale studies, but here we're going to focus much more on smaller scale stuff where we're really looking at um, optimizing airflow inside a room, um, optimizing where we might position radiators or cooling systems, and optimizing for thermal comfort of all of the occupants as well. So specifically today we'll be looking at a classroom. What we can also do by thinking about where we position um, cooling systems and heating systems is overall improve the energy efficiency of the design. So we might find out that we could get away with using one cooler rather than two, for example. So we can overall reduce the amount of energy that is used. Okay, and a little bit about SimScale specifically. So we're a simulation tool that has both CFD and FEA, so we can look at fluids and gases as well as structural analyses, um, all in the cloud and all in the browser. So there's no kind of local install needed and everything is lightweight and runs remotely. Actually, our laptops look nothing like this nice one that you see here. Um, because we simply don't need them. We all have pretty old school laptops and that is perfectly sufficient. So like I said, everything is all in one place. You can run CFD and FEA um, all within the same interface and the same kind of learning process too. So once you've learned one, it's not so difficult to cross train and learn different um, other types of CFD, for example. Uh, we have real time support. So you would once you're using SimScale in the bottom right of the screen, there's a small blue speech bubble, which hopefully Jesus will remember to show later. Um, and you'll get through to either myself or one of my team, like Jesus or many of the other engineers who sit here in the office in Munich and also in the US. You can collaborate. So if you want to share a project with us or a colleague, you don't need to um, share large files or data sets. You can simply share just the web link or the URL to the page you're on, and that is the very kind of simple way of sharing the product and collaborating together. Okay, I'm going to hand over to Jonathan now, who's going to give you an introduction to SAV Systems. Hi, so um, to introduce you to SAV, uh, we've been operating in the UK for about 20 years. Um, we regularly partner with Danish technology experts, um, and as the
the prediction says really we're trying to bring decades of their knowledge to the UK market. What that really means for us is whilst we are um, suppliers, we are also experts in the fields that we deal with as well. So um, we have the benefits of decades of Danish technology expertise um, being brought into sort of a, a quite young marketplace over here. Um, so we can introduce really good technology straight into the market um, and use their expertise to make it work really well. So um, our main focus as a company is actually heat networks. Um, we're market leaders in some of the technology that um, is used in heat networks. The company itself um, does a number of different product ranges. So um, the, the first, the primary one is the Danfoss heat interface units. Um, that makes up a large portion of our business and that supplies straight into, um, into a lot of flats, that sort of thing. Um, but we also do micro CHPs, uh, which are part of a heat network. Um, that comes with a few other things. So construct energy meters, for example, um, they help optimize heat networks as well as the valves that you can see on screen. We do also have these commissioning modules, which are for fan core units, basically. Um, and also one I'm here to talk to you about today, which is the Airmaster MBHR units, which we also call SVUs or smart, um, smart ventilation units as well. Um, so focusing now on classroom ventilation and why that is of interest to us. Um, the reason for focusing on this is that for a long time, buildings have been very leaky, essentially. In the last I don't know, 10, 20 years, the quality of insulation in buildings and the requirements from the building regulations, that sort of thing, have massively improved. Um, so where we previously had buildings that were able to breathe, so um, leaky buildings let air in, let air and also carbon dioxide, that sort of thing, out, um, that sort of stopped happening with the way the buildings are being built. If carbon dioxide builds up, firstly, it can make occupants uncomfortable, but secondly, it massively decreases the ability of those occupants to concentrate. So um, for a learning environment, it's a terrible thing to have high CO2 levels. So finally, in the last about a year, um, this was recognized by the people who govern the, or who decide what the regulations will be for, for UK schools and that led to a reissue of BB 101 and BB 101 is a guidelines on ventilation thermal comfort and indoor air quality in schools and just to give you a brief overview of what that involves and you can see a number of the points here on the screen so um, well so previously we just looked at flow rates and it was sort of arbitrary we're now looking at predetermined CO2 levels that we need to achieve and, and this is a great step forward as far as I'm concerned we also then have requirements on the temperature difference between um, the supplier into the room and what's already in the room, uh, filtration standards that we have to meet, so we're looking at F7 filtration standards, which is the old standard, but still sort of relevant. Um, we have specific delta T requirements for the summer, um, and we also have sound pressure levels that we have to stick to. What's great for us as SAV is that Airmaster has been set up to do this for a long time. Um, what you see on screen now is actually the, the sort of spectrum of ventilation systems that we can now use in the UK. What we had before was basically a situation where we had natural ventilation is what you do. And if there's a really good reason why you can't do it, you can then consider using mechanical ventilation. But this spectrum, um, actually drawn up by Airmaster and put into BV101, says that you have countless different ways that you can ventilate a classroom. Um, the middle section actually is sort of brand new area, hybrid ventilation systems. Uh, the reality is that in a lot of European countries, most of the spectrum would not be allowed. And the UK is sort of like the Wild West. Uh, we're still able to use all sorts of other stuff, um, which is basically natural ventilation. So what an air master uh, is, I mean, in short, it's a device that aims to provide very good indoor air quality without the risk of draft. And the draft is commonly associated with natural ventilation. Um, to give you a short description of the technology, uh, it's an MVHR unit, so we've got heat recovery, 
in the units. Um, it's also decentralised, so units are put in single rooms with very short connections to outside. You then supply an air at a high level into the room um, at a very comfortable temperature, making use of the Coanda effect to distribute that air around the room, whilst also extracting stale air, and that's air with CO2 in it, essentially. Um, anything that enters that unit is filtered, so not only is the heat exchanger and everything else protected within the unit, um, but it means that for environments where you've got poor external air quality, you're able to filter out all the rubbish that we don't want. And um, bearing in mind a lot of our business is in uh, cities in the UK, we've got very big problems with external air quality, uh, and it's fantastic we can deal with that. The spectrum that I just showed you actually allows a, a lot of stuff that really doesn't filter any air. Um, so everything you've got from the left of decentralized mechanical duct free ventilation with automatic bypass, which is essentially an air master, um, doesn't filter incoming air. If you look at the standards of somewhere like um, Munich, for example, you're not allowed to do that anymore. You have to filter air entering into buildings. Um, it's amazing that we still can't do that in the UK, and I, I sort of hope um, that that will change. In addition, one of the main advantages of an air master is that they're fantastic at controlling noise. So again, for city centres, you've got different types of pollution, not only um, air pollution, but noise pollution. So an air master can very strongly attenuate external noise, um, and also is very quiet in its operation. So it's a very, very good package of a number of different issues that come up in BB101. So I guess, Jonathan, that's actually pretty good for our kids over here in Munich, right? So they should, in school, essentially have cleaner air than they would otherwise if they were in the UK. Is that true? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I feel somewhat sorry for children compared to the standards of the rest of Europe. I, mean, I often do presentations where um, people are happy to put in unfiltered systems uh, and you <laughs> I feel you know as an engineer that you don't just have a, a sort of engineering obligation you also have a moral obligation to make sure the children have good indoor air quality it's not their choice where they go to school but it is our choice what quality of school environment we give them and what, what also factors into that is thermal comfort so yeah t traditional solution open the windows let in fresh air, let out stale air. Whilst that works um, in terms of air quality, to some extent, in terms of CO2 level, it works. It doesn't work in terms of pollutants. Um, it also doesn't work in terms of draft. So if you open the window and it's two degrees outside, you're going to very quickly shut that window. Um, so there are standards, such as the ASHRAE standard, which will dictate what is OK to do. Um, unfortunately, BB101 handles those standards with a, a very heavy hand. So, yeah, this this image, I, I know it's a bit of a uh, oversimplified version, but this is what we would typically see um, in a British school. So you've got a high-level opening, um, which would be a window, potentially a low-level opening as well, but not always. Um, and you have air, in this case, rather generously entering at 16 degrees. Um, Something that's not talked about much in the industry is that probably most of the school season um, or time kids are at school in the UK is during the heating season and therefore it's not even going to be 16 degrees outside, it might be 12 degrees. So generously we've said 16. Um, so you're bringing in air at high velocity or an uncontrolled velocity and an uncontrolled temperature. And what typically will happen is that air will be cold, it will hit the warm room air. Um, and it will just drop. So whoever's nearest the window will have this cold air dumped on them. That leads to discomfort. That also leads to people not being able to concentrate properly. And again, it's not something that our kids... You know, I'm <laughs> thinking back to my time in school. It's hard enough to sit and concentrate anyway without the sort of environmental factors influencing you. So this is why we make use of heat exchangers and the kind of effect. So this is your sort of typical air master installation. Um, we've got the unit very close up to the ceiling. External connections are directly through that wall. And in a condition of a 21 degree C classroom and anything above 
um, probably seven degrees outside. We're going to be supplying air into the room at 19. You'll see, I mentioned the velocity before, we're actually supplying air at a very high velocity, so three to four meters per second. Um, the reason for doing that is actually that enables us to have the Coanda effect. So um, with the Coanda effect, the air will actually um, pretty much grip onto the ceiling surface. It will also entrain with the room air as it moves across that ceiling surface. So not only is the air distributing very well throughout the room, but as it entrains with the room air, it's warming up, as it does that, um, the buoyancy increases, it slows down, and as it falls into the room, it should actually come up to a temperature pretty much equal to the room temperature. So in your occupied zone, you have no draft, and we're looking at achieving supply air temperature in the occupied zone of 21 degrees C at a velocity of 0.15 meters per second. Um, so it's the heat exchanger combined with the kind of effect which really makes our units special. I think, uh, John, you might want to take this slide. Yeah, absolutely, I can do. Um, I thought maybe I'd just mention that, I mean, it's pretty clear to me, even just looking at these pictures, this kid looks pretty sad, and this one definitely looks happier. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting for me, actually, because I think I've always been like, pro-environmental, natural convection and stuff, but I don't think I've necessarily thought so much, and I've been doing CFD for so many years, I don't think I've necessarily thought about the pollution, right, that is that the kids would face, and then the kind of huge differences in temperature and how uncontrollable it is too. And we have two, and they can't concentrate on anything, so, yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, there's also, I, I, if you look at, um, I'm not going to bash our competitors, but if you look at <laughs> stuff from people who are in the natural, the hybrid side of the ventilation industry, they'll only talk about the summer time conditions really, or they're very focused on the summer time conditions, but they very rarely talk about CO2 levels. Um, they definitely don't talk about external pollutants. And as I mentioned before, um, we really are lagging behind um, in the UK on what is deemed acceptable standards for our school kids. Um, so I think I said to you a couple of weeks ago, you, your kids are probably lucky being in the UK. Uh, sorry, being in Germany and not in the UK. Um, in addition, they they very commonly talk about lower energy usage um, in naturally ventilated classrooms. And yeah, at the point of use, if you were to put some sort of energy monitoring system on that window or on that hybrid ventilation unit, it would use very little energy because it's not doing very much. But if you consider um, that an MVHR unit, any MVHR unit is pulling a huge amount of heat from that room and just sending it straight back in, but with a hydraulic break, i.e. yeah, going back into the room is clean, you've recovered, say, four kilowatts of energy from that classroom. What you would do in a situation where you don't have heat recovery is first kick out some kilowatts of energy that you've just put into that room and then have to bring in air which is at a lower temperature than your room air and heat that up as well. So if you look at the, the energy use holistically, you'll find that it might balance itself out and it might actually be in favour of a mechanical ventilation unit. That might also be another reason why Germany, you know, maybe Munich specifically, but um, German standards as a whole lead you towards um, using mechanical ventilation instead of natural. Yeah, that does make a lot of sense. Oddly enough, though, we don't have it in our office here, which is insanely hot in the summer in a loft, but go figure. <laughs> well, I can recommend a manufacturer if you're interested. Yeah, maybe we should talk. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to mention one thing um, around convective heat transfer. So this is um, one of the analysis types within SimScale, and we use that for this type of analysis. Actually, the classroom didn't get this warm, to be quite honest. Um, but we use it basically to when there's temperature variations within the room um, which are going to cause the air density to change and then rise as it lowers or fall if it's um, denser. So the cold air will fall and the warmer air would rise. Um, so all of that would also be captured um, realistically. So it's predominantly used for um, natural convection. Okay, at this stage I'm going to hand over to Jesus who is going to talk through the setup that we went through to achieve this in SimScale. Yep, so here we can see basically uh, the three main steps uh, for, for the simulation. So in the left hand side we have like the CAD model that we need to, uh, to create outside SimScale to, to, to simulate it. 
And then so we have a valid one, we jump to the second step where we import the CAD model to the platform. Um, we will generate um, a mesh, as you can see in the, in the middle picture, and we will define every um, ambient uh, conditions, any heat sources, any ventilation uh, system you want to add to the simulation, and then just let it run. And once we have the results, we will be in the third step on the right, uh, where we can analyze all the different results of the different simulations we get, analyze velocity, pressure, temperature, and be able to do these uh, design decisions um, uh, very useful for, for our customers. So the objectives for, for this project would be uh, uh, mainly uh, um, being able to model these kind of ventilation systems, um, heat sources in a, in a room, um, once we are able to model this, uh, we will focus on the results to detect any uh, air patterns in the ventilations, any hot spots in the in the room, any draughts, or and, and also take a look at the ASRAE uh, standards uh, regarding thermal comfort in, in in a room that we will see uh, afterwards. And from a more general point of view, uh, being becoming familiar with this uh, convective heat transfer analysis type in SimScale and, and show you what we are able to, to do and, and offer with this analysis type. So here we have the first step, the CAD model. This is a simplified model where we started our, our simulations with, uh, with subsystems. Um, you can see uh, we don't have uh, much detail inside the room, but it's not really uh, needed to, to the purpose of this. Um, but yeah, we mainly have the MBHR unit where we will have air getting in and out the room. Um, we have also a radiator uh, being as a heat source and we will also model people. Uh, you can see there, they are modeled as cubes. Uh, they are not really accurate, but it's like a, a useful uh, workflow for, for this kind of simulations just to see which heat will be they emitting. And you can also see that we have some lights, some windows uh, that could be modeled to add some uh, additional heat sources, but in this case, as we say, like we are in a first stage, and and it's enough to 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 have an idea of how this uh, a unit is working to ventilate the, the whole room. So jumping to a general setup, um, first from once we import the model in the platform, I will show you later on in the in the live demo. Uh, but we need to do a closed inner region operation to get this uh, model we can see here in the picture. And it is mainly just um, extracting the, the inner volume where the fluid will be simulated inside the room as we are not interested in anything else. And once we have this, we uh, choose the analysis type, in this case the, the convective heat transfer with a steady state and standard turbulence model in compressible flow. Um, then the next step is to generate uh, this mesh. Um, I, I have to say that it's uh, automatically generated, like we have defined some uh, inflation layer uh, refinements, some refinements in the, in the people, in the radiator, but it is really straightforward and automatic. Um, I will go over it uh, unless we, any of, of, of the viewers have any questions about it in the live demo. And finally, once we have the mess, the only thing we need to worry about is to define our boundary conditions. So, apart from all the walls that can be automatically assigned as a standard adiabatic wall, uh, we need to define both the radiator and the people in red and green in the picture as, as heat sources, as a heat flux of, of 400 parts per meter square and 70 uh, respectively. And then for the structure unit, we have um, both conditions, um, like a fan curve outlet from the extraction unit point of view, putting air into the room. And this fan curve, what, what means it's like we will be able to input uh, a curve um, of pressure versus flow, flow rate. So depending on the conditions, uh, you will be uh, putting more or less air into the room. And then just an atmospheric pressure inlet back to the, to the extraction unit in the red flag on the on the side of the of the unit. So from this point, we can we can change to to the platform for a live demonstration. Here we have um, the post processor um, in the platform. So as a quick view, we can see here an iso volume with the high velocities inside the room. So we can see basically all the flow getting into the room from from the inlet. 
uh, hitting the, the opposite uh, wall and spreading all around and also getting um, the air back to the unit, the hot air um, colored by red colors. And here we can also see a, a cutting plane with the temperature. We can see it's quite uniform and we can also with these vectors, if we zoom in, we can see um, the direction of this flow all around the people. So we will be back uh, to the solutions in a while, but first we can uh, take a look at the, at the general setup uh, for the simulation. So starting from the geometry, that's how it looks, the original model that we imported, right? So as I said, first we need to generate this uh, extraction operation as we are not interested in the walls, in the roof, in the, in the, in the round, just the inner volume. So we just generate and closed in a region here and we will get our, our geometry that will look like this one. So then you just need to create a simulation uh, and select the convective heat transfer kind of analysis and create the, the simulation. And then a tree will appear like this. Hey Jesus, yeah? what is the difference? Um, maybe it's worth explaining between the convective and um, conjugate heat transfer? Yeah, definitely. Um, when we are running this kind of uh, convective heat transfer simulations, as I said before, we are just interested in the fluid domain, right? So we have some boundary conditions in the walls saying how hot is it, if it's adiabatic, what heat conditions you have there. But if we uh, are also interested in how the, the heat is affecting to the solid, we also want to take into account this um, conduction in the solid, we have this conjugate heat transfer model where we can uh, take both um, the solid and the fluid, basically. Cool, thanks. Well, and before I forget, uh, here it's the, the chat uh, support that uh, John mentioned before. So here is where you can reach us anytime and share your projects with us. Um, if everything is fine, I will move to the convective heat transfer uh, simulation. Um, yeah, I mean, here in the mess, it's automatic, as I said. I set here, like, some refinements. I can go really quick uh, through it. Like, we can set region refinements to set, like, a maximum cell size in the domain. We can refine in different uh, surfaces with a minimum and maximum side, and also, like, add these boundary inflation layers uh, where, where it is interesting to be added. Um, but apart from that, once we the mess is generated, we choose the, the material as error. The only thing we have to care about is the boundary conditions, as I said before. So you can see here uh, at the inlet of the, of the unit how we have this fan pressure, inlet condition for pressure, and adding this table with the curve I mentioned before, and just the temperature of this, of this fluid. And then we have just the standard pressure outlet condition and the heat source is just a model uh, with a kind of temperature as a turbulent heat flux and this value of the heat flux and the initial uh, temperature of the, of the surface. Same for the people. Sorry, um, just, yep. Okay, just going to just butt in very quickly. I, yes. I think um, what we're really trying to achieve here, on our part at least, is to achieve a, a room temperature that we were happy with. Mm -hmm. um, that I, there was a lot of back and forth in trying to get, a, you know, normally we have a thermostat in the classroom mm -hmm. um, and that room will try and be maintained at, say, 21 degrees. Um, so whilst we know we'll have those kids in there putting out 70 watts per meter squared mm -hmm. on average, um, there was a lot of back and forth at the time on you know, how much heat do we actually need from the radiator. I think we went through a few iterations to yeah. decide what would actually get us the right temperature condition. Yeah, definitely. Like, it's true, like, once we are not sure about the, yeah, about the values of, of the heat of the radiator of the people, like, uh, there are some standards. But, uh, yeah, I mean, um, just to, to reach, a, um, like, an ideal uh, configuration, sometimes we, we need to, to play a bit with the values till you see that you lead to temperatures that really make sense. But, yeah, I mean, actually, in this case, then what what we have the, the better impact in the simulation would be the temperature and the and the flow rate that we will have here in the inlet that will cool down 
all the room. But yeah, I mean, definitely we have to be sure uh, with the values we set um, for the radiator and the people. Like, you need to 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 see that it's a value per meter square, so it depends on the geometry. So you need to be really sure, like the the surface of the, of the bodies that you're applying this heat source, that it's um, a total um, but that makes sense. Um, yeah, to have, as you said, like uh, realistic conditions. But yeah, basically, basically that. Okay, so yeah, if uh, you're fine with this, uh, we can just go back to the results and, and check them out. It will need to be loaded again. So for us, I, I imagine this sort of thing is what takes hours and hours on a um, a PC if it's just sat there trying to render all this geometry or um, do all the calculations. And for us, choosing SimScale was a, a large proportion of it was based on the fact that we wouldn't need a dedicated computer um, which would be running for hours or days potentially to do anything. Um, having it in browser has been fantastic for us. Um, yeah. I think we, we had a little bit of training um, for our, uh, for my colleague Megan who um, actually does all the hard work on this. Um, but you know, it's very easy for her to get to grips with it and to be able to generate these sorts of results relatively easily. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, John. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's one of the advantages of being like an online uh, platform, uh, definitely. Um, so yeah, um, going going back to, to the results, uh, here we can see like different planes. Uh, you can create them here and play with the position all around the place. And, and you can check um, how the temperature like right now, the, the range is set between 17 and 27 degrees Celsius. Uh, here we have it in Kelvin. Uh, but you can see like how in, in all the mid height of the room, uh, we have a really uniform temperature of around yeah, 21, 22 degrees. And it's quite fine. Um, we can see how the hot uh, areas are more in the near the, the ceiling of, of the room going up. And we can see also like how the cooler it's coming from the unit and will be um, at some point like it will be cooling all all the room. So we can easily check this with the cutting planes. We can also change to to velocity. So you you can yeah figure out if we have some droughts in the in the um, in the room. But basically, you can see here from a range from zero to one for, for velocity, how everything is quite steady, but this velocity that we saw previously with the ISO volume, how you have the high velocity here, really stuck to the ceiling and going to the opposite um, opposite um, wall and recirculating. Maybe as well also because uh, we are in an early stage, we are simulating kind of a simplified inlet condition, but if we move to the next stage with a more realistic one, we will be able to see a more distributed uh, uh, yeah, velocity of a uh, more distributed cooler in, in the room. Right, John? Jonathan? Yeah, that's right. Um, what looks really good for me here is that right, we're sort of aiming in the darker blue range for where these people's heads are. Um, and we've really managed to achieve that. Which yeah, which is fantastic. Um, I said before briefly we're looking for 21 degrees and 0.15 meters per second in mm -hmm. the occupied zone, um, and I really think we've hit that bang on. Um, yeah, we can easily change the happy. range here. For example, like in this case, you are interested in see this. Uh... Oh, I click a comma instead of a point. <laughs> Okay. Welcome to Germany. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we can see uh, uh, having like the red range that would be the, the limit of this 0 0.5 meters per second, like away of this uh, trough next to the ceiling. Mm -hmm. In the rest of the room, we have uh, comfortable uh, ranges. 
Yeah, actually, for me, it's really interesting to see um, how the Quando effect actually looks. Yeah. Because whilst it, the only real way to see it is to do a smoke test. Um, and the smoke test is, it's not, I wouldn't say it's difficult, but a bit of a pain. Um, you don't always get the opportunity. So um, fantastic to see the shape of the Quando as we're expecting. Yeah, this with with these particle traces, I know it's a bit uh, crowded, but yeah, no, you can, you can you can really see this quanta effect, like how the air is coming really laminar at the ceiling, and how it creates this quanta effect you were talking about here, and how it yeah. distributes all over the all over the room. So yeah, it's, it's the air distribution quite, looks brilliant. Yeah, I see. I think you were sort of leading me towards well, what the next step for us is from what you see now is to actually spread that air distribution outwards a bit. Um, what we didn't take into account when we sort of simplified our initial models was that there are um, lamella on the supply grill into mm -hmm. the room so we can actually angle the airflow um, to spread out across the room a bit more. In this case it's very direct, it's a jet yeah. basically. Um, yeah. The reality is it spreads out more than that mm -hmm. um, to the sides and that would give you a better a more even air distribution across the room exactly yeah so yeah if um, you don't want to see anything else from here um, I, we can move to the slides again and, and show a, a summary of, of the results yeah I'm, I'm very happy with that I was, <laughs> I was really pleased with the results we got um, because I mean generally I try to work in a very open manner and I think with the way we entered all our data into um, SimScale was very I don't, I don't want to say honest but you know it, it was genuine um, all the inputs were the technical data that we had the standard room conditions that you get in a British school so, so 60 meters squared 31 maybe 32 occupants um, we tried to make it as normal um, as possible and then to see it come out with, you know, air distribution is great, temperature is great, no draft, that sort of thing, um, was brilliant. Good. So yeah, I will go back to the slides and I will, we can talk about it like in this um, summary. Uh, we have here about the results. So yeah, what we've seen in the post processor here, taking a look at vertical slices with temperature, we can see that how how the cooler regions uh, around 17, no, not 17, actually, like 20 degrees are more like in the ceiling where the, the air is coming in, near the walls, in the ground, and the hot um, spots are more above the people in the ceiling, um, accumulating here in, in these corners where this jet distribution, as you said, doesn't let the air um, uh, get better distributed in that um, bottom corners, but mm. yeah, if we take a look at these PMB uh, values for the ASHRAE uh, standards, um, for an ideal comfort range it would be like between minus 0 0.5 and 0 0.5, that if you see the scale it would be around these dark uh, colors in the room, so we can see that we get the effect we're looking for, like really inside the room, most of it, it's inside this uh, comfort range. So we can see that, uh, that yeah, like the ventilation system is really uh, creating a good atmosphere inside the room. Yeah, absolutely. Looks <laughs> very comfortable to me. <laughs> yeah. Um, taking a look at the same from an horizontal uh, plane at this, um, mid height for for the standard as well for sitting people um, so you can see here that it's totally comfor comfortable like all the region is is really comfortable so all the kids will uh, will be enjoying the, the lesson I hope <laughs> you can't really account for the content of the you know, <laughs> yeah. we do our best to make the environment nice but um, the learning yeah. about it, not under our control <laughs> Definitely. Um, yeah, with this with this scary picture, I just want to show you where these uncomfortable ranges from the PMB variables would be. So I'm just plotting volumes with uh, values higher than 0 0.5 and lower than minus 0 0.5. Um, so yeah, um, despite the 
how scary the, the, the picture may look like, you can see that inside the room there are no volumes of, of hot spots or cold, cool spots. More maybe in these corners uh, we, we were talking about before, but in, in, the, in the room uh, it, it looks pretty fine. I, I think that some of those will sort of resolve themselves as well with the if we make some changes to the model on the distribution that exactly. some of those areas will be re reduced. Um, but the the standards that we look at in the UK focus on mm -hmm. largely on the occupied zone anyway. Yeah. And I, I don't think that the only reason why you'd want to know what was happening at ceiling height is what effect it has on the occupied exactly. area. Um, it doesn't really matter otherwise. Mm-hmm. It's good to see. That's quite a, yeah. Somewhat demonic <laughs> distribution in color. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, I mean, finally, like talking about the the droughts in the in the room and the quantum effect. Like here, I show again like some slices about velocity up to a range of zero point five. That could be like the uncomfortable one for your standards. And so yeah, basically in the room, the velocities are quite low, and and you you can see this quantum effect how the flow is really stuck to the to the ceiling. And, and distributing in, in this way, so we are definitely in the good in the good way with this uh, with this uh, ventilation system. Um, yeah, finally some traces as I showed in the in the post processor in the platform, where we can see these main uh, flow patterns with the quantum effect, with the flow going up from the radiator, hitting everything, the flow getting back to the to the unit, uh, but you don't see any more like like droughts um, around the around the room that what that's what we want to avoid so yeah just to to finish uh, and before everybody ask uh, we have some good news and um, we will be able to have PNB and PPD available in our platform within the next uh, few days so that would be great to be able to to see all these uh, pictures that we had to take from uh, an external post processor. Um, so yeah, that would be really useful for this kind of HVAC uh, simulations. So yeah, I guess we can see we can say that everybody is happy now. Um, just to to conclude, uh, we can see after this simulation uh, that with SimScale we can carry this kind of HVAC CLT studies. Uh, we can model the different uh, mechanical ventilation systems, uh, heat and cooling sources, um, optimize our designs uh, as the one from, from subsystem. And we've seen that it's really um, getting the, like, uh, achieving the aims that they have with this quantum effect and no drafts in the room and really comfortable temperature inside. So I don't know if you would like to end, uh, add anything to, to finish? Um, I, I just think it's a, as a point of interest for the, it's always interesting for me how we see this developing and I, I think um, we've got a really standard classroom that mm -hmm. we're very happy with. What, the, other, the other sorts of things we would like to look at is, okay, that was a very average UK condition, we'll probably go for the two extremes, so, um, okay. so minus five external temperatures, uh, which is what we work down to in the UK, probably do a, a summertime condition as well. But I also like to try some, again, it's competitors, I don't want to be rude about them, but you, the standards actually allow you, if you're not mechanical ventilation, if you're natural, you can, you have a completely set of, different set of standards that you apply to your equipment. It's not logical, it, it's bizarre, um, but one of the things we'll do probably is try and put into our models some competitor stuff to see what we think they'll do um, and that would just be of interest um, as far as what we're able to do with this CFD is for the consultants we work with and um, potentially model their projects to see um, you know if they've got some strange rooms or um, something very specific we'd like to be able to model what they're actually going to get in their classrooms and hopefully you know in the real world prove that what we've it's funny, it's sort of a backwards proof here. We know this works in the real world, but we're using CFD to show that it still works, but hopefully prove that what we're showing in the CFD is also what we get in the real world. Thanks, Jonathan. This is John back again. I, I just took over. I also just realized we both work with Amazing Mix, who also do all of the work in the background. So 
Cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for everything, actually. Um, I guess the, the last question is, does anyone listening have any questions for us? So far, I can't see any. If there are in the next kind of 30 seconds or so, we'll, we'll get on to answering. Otherwise, we'll uh, wrap up. Was there anything final that you wanted to add, though, Jonathan, before we do? Simscale is concerned. We, we found it very easy to do all of this, I think. Uh, Megan, my Megan, might have wanted to tear her out with me a few times with me saying, you know, change this, change this. But um, learning curve was not steep. The advantages of the platform being browser-based, etc., have been fantastic for us. And, um, you know, I think you guys probably have a much better estimate of it, but I imagine costs for actually getting a CFD platform and dedicated computer and the, the results of that mean that yeah, you could be paying maybe four times as much to be able to actually do CFD and that makes people very hesitant to to get on board with it. Um, for us, yeah, the advantages of using SimScale and how simple it was, how um, how little we actually need in terms of computing power, that sort of thing, have made it really very easy for us to get what we want to see. Um, even though, as I say, Megan's probably been cursing me to <laughs> yeah, stop changing things. Yeah, some things just won't change. <laughs> That's cool, <laughs> Definitely though. Definitely not limited to this. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to hear. Thanks, thanks really, for sharing. Um, yeah, I, I think my in my past, I've only ever worked with desktop CFD code, so this is the first time I've been at a place where everything is kind of free from those shackles, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. I have, definitely have some comparisons in mind, but also won't bash competitors. <laughs> okay, um, then thank you very much. There are no questions that should be answered that we haven't already answered as we've been going. Um, so at this point, we'll wrap up. So thanks again, Jonathan very much and I'll speak to you soon. Yep, been a pleasure. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Bye.